Hey everybody, it is time once again for the Rankening! I am continuing my never-ending quest to rank every single game in my collection using the Pub Meeple Ranking Engine, which means I have to go through literally thousands of A-B comparisons. Uh, game X versus Game Y versus Game Z versus Game A versus Game B, etc, etc. And I think this is the sixth episode. Folks, I'll be honest, I don't know if I'm ever going to make it to the end of this, but it seems like people are enjoying the show anyway, mostly because they're getting to hear about some really fantastic games that they might have missed somewhere along the lines. And I am often comparing some of my favorites from yesteryear right up against the hotness of the day. And often the games of yesteryear win out. So I willing to bet, unless you've uh, been running a board game media channel for the last uh, decade, that we're going to talk about a few games today you might not have heard of before. Let me know down in the uh, show notes if you were surprised to find out about some of these games. Also, because this is just going to be nothing more than just a uh, list of, hey, I like this one more than this one, but I don't like this one as much as this one. Uh, If you disagree, let me know down in the comments, too, because I always find that very fun reading. Anyway, though, um, I'm here in the RV. We're at Lake Powell, uh, just outside of Arizona. We had to cross into the Utah border, I believe, to get here. So I've got a nice view. Uh, This is where Jen and I have spent the last 48 hours just relaxing on, well, it should be on a beach, but unfortunately the lake is largely dried up. And so to get close to the water, it was way too soft to the sand to drive this big behemoth down there. So I've got a nice view from a distance. But what I need to be focusing on is not Lake Powell, but instead, where are you? The uh, ranking engine. There we are, right there. So we're going to pick up right where we left off. Um, It was Steam Time versus Dominion. And all right, so Dominion, I don't think I need to say anything about that. I assume everybody knows about Dominion, but you might not have heard of Steam Time from designer Rudiger Dorn, one of the all-time greats to design. This is one of his more recent designs. It came out uh, probably like five years ago, give or take. And it's a worker placement game where we have um, steampunk dirigibles that are traveling through time. Uh, and the uh, interesting thing is the worker placement board where we are is, is kind of a dynamic variable one that creates all these different time zones. We can go way back in time or just back, you know, a hundred years or just back a couple of decades or whatever to uh, pick up different resources because this is a Euro game. We're converting goods into points, but it's based on, you know, the space-time continuum. But what really makes this game special is the, uh, the flow of the worker placement because when I, I think every round, I think I have three workers I have to place. The first one, I want to send them way back in time because the next worker I'm going to place has to be forward. So my first worker, if I go back to prehistoric times, great. That means my next one could go to Victorian era or you know, I could do two in Victorian era back to back. But if the first place I want to go is, some, is only like a couple of decades ago, that means I'm stuck there and I can't get to that stuff. And because uh, this is a dynamically generated board, sometimes I want to get this stuff that's right in the recent past before I go into the ancient past, but you can't do that because you have to follow the rules of time travel. You have to jump all the way back and then move forward through um, time. And that is a thematic excuse to create a very fun and interesting twist on worker placement uh, that really tightens the things up and makes for some very, very tense decisions. And so here's the deal, folks. Comparing these two games... Oh, plus, again, it's fun having a little... Uh, balloon, dirigible, time-traveling uh, meeples as well. So, here's the deal. If Dominion, if I was not including the, uh, what are we at now, 13 different expansions worth of content for Dominion, when I rank these, I'm not ranking them just base game to base game. I'm ranking them based on the, how they exist in my collection. And so, I've got a lifetime's worth of Dominion cards. So, Dominion is going to win. But here's the deal. If I was just doing base box of Dominion versus Steam Time, there is no choice about it. Steam Time would crush Dominion because it's got so much cool, fun, and interesting, unique gameplay. Um, I mean, I think the closest I can think of is Gizia, which is not a game I kept because when we played a million years ago, we found it didn't work well at two. Steam Time works great. But like I said, taking into account all the Dominion content, I am going to swipe right and choose Dominion. If I can highlight... The browser. There we go. Boom. Next up, Adventureland versus Viscounts of the West Kingdom. So, Adventureland is uh, an interesting game. It's from Haba. 
who are known for family-friendly games that really kind of focus on, you know, being for youngsters and whatnot. But a few years ago, again, I don't know, at least probably almost half a decade ago, they started experimenting with a new line where, okay, they're still family-friendly kind of gateway-ish style games, but they're not for little kids. Uh, you know, they are for the parents and, you know, the older kids. And uh, they, they've brought out like four or five games in this kind of alternate line of theirs over the years. And Adventureland is by far the best. And that's probably because it's from Kramer and Kiesling, the ultimate um, in elegant Euro design. It is a fantasy adventure game where we all have workers or knights, warriors, whatever you want to call them, who start out in the top left corner of this board that is a grid of all kinds of, you know, X, Y. I can move over three and down two and I could explore a cave. Or I could move over ten and then down five uh, and I'd be halfway through the board uh, because I really want to grab that diamond that's just off of the river or whatever. Here's the thing. Every time I move... That's interesting. This is right after steam time. The thing is, the further to the right I go with my workers, they can never go back left. The further east they go, they can never go west. The further south they go, they can never go north. And a lot of this is exploration, you know, zipping out, trying to, you know, figure out what's out there waiting for us. And um, so... You have the situation where you just want to take maybe, I'm just going to go over a few over and a few down so I've got more flexibility for future turns. Because if I go all the way east, then I'm stuck just moving south. But there, you can see what's out there. And uh, the game heavily incentivizes you to make big moves, to jump into the middle of the board. Which means you've just cut that adventurer off from 50% of every place they could go. But there are all kinds of... Uh, the game comes with a lot of different modules and setups you can do. Uh, so it can get more and more and more complex. And when you're playing... Well, I should say... When you're playing with a special little variant that Jen and I play with, which requires having some extra components to keep track of where we've been and where we haven't been. Because whenever you get to a place, we draw a card, and that determines what's you know there. And um, so, or I'm sorry, not what's there, but it determines where we've been and where we haven't been. And so, being able to keep track of that, well, it'd be a, a an onerous memory game. But once you just start putting all these tokens on the board to keep track of what you've done and what you haven't done. It becomes really rich and crunchy, and Jen and I love it a lot. Uh, you can watch my run through. I'm sure I demonstrated that's how we play the game. Uh, but anyway, that's Adventureland. Now, Thy Council of the West Kingdom, of course, came out a few years ago, so it's a little bit more fresh in people's minds. Which one did Viscounts? Wasn't it Architects, Paladins, and Viscounts? Viscounts is the best of the three West Kingdom games. It's basically a huge. Um, multi-tiered rondelle game. You've got an outer rondelle, an inner rondelle, and we're constantly moving clockwise uh, as our Viscounts. Um, you know, picking stuff up and using it elsewhere. Uh, there's a lot of sub-games that are going on, and it's a really rich, crunchy game. And if I were comparing base game to base game, the thing is, I mean, they're, they're both kind of fantastical adventure, you know, medieval era games of Euro goods conversion-y type exploration type things. They both, they, it's interesting that uh, Pub Meeple, Ranking Engine just put them randomly together. But Adventureland is clean, pure, fast-playing, simple, elegant, what Kramer and Kiesinger are known for. Whereas Viscounts is a big, bombastic game with a thick book of rules and a really big, long, crunchy game as opposed to a fast-playing little thing. And so, I would say they're both almost equally good at what they do. And um, if I had to judge them off the base, I'd really have to probably go with Adventureland because these days, Jen and I find we... I mean, I, I don't want super-duper lightweight games, but there are ways you can play Adventureland where it gets crunchy enough for uh, gamers like me and Jen. Thing is, not just comparing base to base. I think Adventureland got like a little mini expansion at some point, but it wasn't really that much. The important thing is... Viscounts eventually got um, a, an expansion that turns it into a cooperative game. When Jen and I played that cooperative game, she said that might be my favorite cooperative experience I've ever had. And that's and that's saying something, but at the same time, it is really excellent. So again, because of the expansion, I'm going to give it to Viscounts uh, because it brings in that co-op. But without it, it probably would have gone to Adventurelands. But again, I'm swiping right. All right, uh, comparison number three, uh, Railways of the World um, versus The Edge of Darkness. Now, these two don't have anything to do with each other. Railways of the World from, um, was it Glenn Drover and Martin Wallace, I believe, right? I think this was the two of them working together. As far as I'm concerned, this is the premier 
big epic economic simulation of you know uh, building rail lines in the 1800s the uh, you know the era of rail um, you know, there's a lot of games that have come out. There's the super heavy stuff like the 18xx series. There's more lightweight stuff like Ticket to Ride. Railways of the World exists somewhere kind of in the middle, and it is brilliant. The thing that really makes it stand out for me and Jen more than anything else is um, the way once you have developed a track from from one city to another, and then you'll create it a a uh, a contract where, hey, this city which produces blue cubes will from now on deliver. People call this pickup and deliver game. It's not. All the pickup and deliver game happens automatically because all I do once I've made this connection with a rail with my rail lines between these two cities, I say, okay, the blue cubes over here, uh, they come off the board because they are now being delivered to this other place, and I now get income from that for the rest of the game. And so this is a huge game of snowballing. The more you do, the way your economic engine works. Um, really much more accurately reflects real-world business than a lot of games, and I really appreciate it for that. And it's very satisfying, and over the years, so many maps have come out for it. In recent years, publisher, what is it, Eagle Griffin, I think, they've started working with other designers from around the world, like Hishashi Hiyashi, designer of trains to make a, a, you know, a, a Japanese version or you know new... Expansion. I think, did Vito Lasarda work on one set in Portugal? So that's really, really cool. I've got, I think I've got three or four different maps, and to this day, our favorite though of all the ones that we played is still the Europe map. That's the way to play it because it works great as a two-player game. But anyway, that's Railways of the World. Now we go up against Edge of Darkness, a game from uh, John D. Clare, the creator of Mystic Vale, and this is another card crafting game from him. And it's really interesting. It is a competitive deck builder at heart. But here's the thing: there's only one deck. All players are building the same deck. We share <clears throat> control of it. So um, on my turn, the, the big deck, which represents all the resources that are available to the kingdom that we are both trying to see flourish, um, you know, and we get prestige by helping the kingdom out the most. It, it's about, I think, like five cards or something like that. And when a card is taken, the other ones slide over, new ones come out, all that kind of stuff, that ascension-y type stuff you expect to see. But the cards are um, craftable cards, which means they start out being able to do a little thing, but they each one is in a sleeve, and all the cards are trans are like mylar translucent plastic cards. And over time, the cards become more powerful because we get these upgrades, we slide them into the sleeve, and now I see there's two cards in that sleeve or three cards in that sleeve. Card crafting is awesome. You know, Publisher AEG and Don D. Clare have done several different takes on it, and Edge of Darkness is the heaviest version of it. But it's not the card crafting that makes this game so special, in all honesty. It's the fact that, hey, I've upgraded this particular card. It goes into the discard pile. I get to use it. Eventually, it'll show up again. Maybe it'll show up on your turn, and you get to trigger it because we share um, custody of a communal deck of cards in a deck builder. And that's really cool. That, I mean, again, you don't even need the card crafting to make this game really unique, really stand out from the crowd. And I really like it a lot. It's gotten a bunch of expansions too. And I love also the fact that while you can just throw the expansion content in, mix and match however you want, the game and all the expansion comes with like this multi-chapter story that tells the evolution of this world if you play through and it's different setups and all that. It's like taking the different setups of Dominion but putting a story to them and telling you to play in a certain order. They didn't have to do that, but I love that they did it. And I'm got, okay, I got to decide between the two. The best rail route building game in the industry Versus the best card crafting game. I think it's going to be uh, Edge of Darkness. I think I'm going to give it to Edge of Darkness. Uh, because, again, I love that idea of a communal deck that we're both building. Like, hey, don't use that. That's my card. You know, kind of stuff is really fun. Okay. Let's go on then to Key Flow versus Dungeon Decorators. Oh, my goodness. A Key Flow is a sequel to Key Flower. Uh, which is in my top 10 games of all time. And Keyflow is very, very cool. It is hard to describe. It is another one of these Euro-style games of harvesting goods and converting them into other goods to create victory points and all the kind of stuff you'd normally expect. The interesting thing about it is the board you've got to harvest from are these cool little folding 
almost origami boards that you, you okay i've got this board i think it becomes like a two by three grid of different places i can send my workers to harvest goods and grow goods and like that but you can take these boards and you can flip them and you can fold them and you can manipulate them and so they change and evolve over the course of the game i mean it's obvious that this game was designed to come up with hey let's come up with a cool game to use this really re wait, wait 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 a minute am i thinking of keep low or am i thinking of a different one Hold on a second. I just want to make sure I have this right. Let's go. Let's go to Board Game Geek because there's been a few different games in the Keedom series, and I'm 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 I want to make sure I'm not thinking of Key Market Board Game Geek Key uh, Key Flow. I'm pretty sure I've got this right. Key Flow, the board game. I just need to look at a picture of this to remind myself. And because we've actually parked and we've got the Starlink set up, I've got access to decent internet speed. So let me look at it. There's a picture of it set up. And no, I'm thinking of a different game. Oh my goodness. I am glad I checked. Okay, folks, which one am I thinking of now? Um, shoot. Now I'm going to go and look that up. Uh, am I? Am I going to look it up? It doesn't matter because Keyflow is uh basically yeah 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 folks i don't remember which one i'm thinking of mention it down in the comments for anybody because i gotta i mean I, there's so much for me to keep in my head while i'm doing this key flow is basically i remember i said hey key flowers are my top 10 games of all time key flow is the other one it's the one that basically takes key flower and streamlines it down into a much more fast playing game you know, kind of gets rid of the whole, oh, worker placement slash auction thing that makes Keyflower so great, but still is excellent. So Keyflower, again, is one of the all-time greats, but it's a big game. It's a long game. It's a heavy game. It's a crutchy game. It can also be a kind of a cutthroat game, which is kind of surprising that Jen and I enjoy it so much. Keyflower simplifies and streamlines it down into a more midweight game, and it's really wonderful, incredibly satisfying engine building game, uh, all driven by cards. Uh, you just saw a picture of it over there, right? Uh, but then I closed the picture. What is wrong with me? Yeah, uh, but it is still all about, you know, uh, upgrading your, you know, your little new world, uh, the you know, colony that you're trying to make. Uh, the worker placement has to do with these cards that let you activate things in different ways. It's really sharp. And I like it a lot. Not as much as Keyflower, you know, because it, they did strip out a lot of stuff that really makes Keyflower special, but still really great. That's against Dungeon Decorators. Now, Dungeon Decorators made, was it my... I think it made it into my top five games of the year it came out. I don't remember. It was like two or three years ago it came out. It is a tile-laying game where players are competing. We are dungeon decoration firms. And it's a, it's a game where we use, uh, what is it, King Domino-style tile drafting. Where, you know, hey, the better one I grab, the more likely I'm going to be later in turn order. So I'll have to wait. And I won't be able to. And I'm denying myself bonuses in the future so I can get what I really want right now. You know, the King Domino thing, which works really nicely here. But the interesting thing is, we're grabbing these tiles, and these tiles are multi-use because they can either be the rooms and corridors and dungeons of the dungeon that we're trying to decorate. We build and decorate dungeons for our exclusive clientele. Every time you play, there's, I think, three different cards um, for three different dungeon lords who have specific things that they want in their dungeons. They want particular types of decorations. They want particular... Um, uh, configurations of how rooms and corridors work and all that kind of stuff. So everybody can see what all the objectives are. You, so you know when you're grabbing those tiles, which ones really help with which objective. But the interesting thing is, when you take this tile, you can put it down so it extends a corridor. It, it, it puts a room in that you know ends a corridor. So it's trying to do that. Or you can flip the tiles over because on the other side of the tiles are decorations. Spooky lighting, cobwebs, um, you know, um, uh, skeletons, stuff like that. And what's really interesting about this game is you are effectively doing two simultaneous tile land games at once in one space. Because I'm trying to do this more traditional thing that almost feels like a dungeon version of Carcassonne. I'm trying to make my own little perfect dungeon, you know, make the corridors, get the right types of rooms next to each other, stuff like that. But then next to those corridors and rooms, I'm trying to put these tiles, rotating them so that the right decorations appear in the right place. So as I'm building the dungeon, I have to leave enough space on the on the table open so that I can put all these decoration tiles around them so that I can achieve all these goals. It's freaking brilliant. 
It was in my top five of the year it came out. I do not remember what year that was. It is a criminally overlooked game. One of the best tile layers of all time, as I'm concerned. So while Keyflow is phenomenal, a great simplified, streamlined version of one of my faves of all time, it cannot touch one of the greatest tile layers, Dungeon Decorated. Okay, so swipe and right again. It's all right today. Orbis versus Merlin. Okay, Merlin is from designer, my favorite designer of all time, Steffenfeld. And it's a rolling move game. Uh, you know, the, the ultimate insult to modern board game geeks, the roll and move, uh, Stefan Veld says, step aside, let me show you how to do roll and move properly. And it's excellent. We, um, because it, it really enhances roll and move. If I recall correctly, I think by default, we're rolling three dice, maybe two dice. And we have the round table, you know, of, of Arthurian lore. And it is basically... Uh, a big uh, set of action spots we can go to to do all kinds of things, you know, conquer territory and, um, you know, populate castles and all kinds of things. Uh, I, I, like many Seven Fell games, there's like three or four mini games all plugged in. And you really got to decide which ones are you focusing on and all that. But the whole thing is driven by this core idea that after I roll my dice, I decide which of my workers I'm going to move based on what the dice showed up. And that's going to tell me where I can land and what actions I can do. But there are all kinds of ways. I mean, you could uh, mitigate things by, hey, I'm going to use this power to move counterclockwise instead of clockwise. I've got different characters who can move around the board. So I've got a lot of flexibility. And it just works fantastically. It's honestly one of my favorite Feld games, I think. I really, really love it. Although, this is interesting. I've been talking about in the previous ones how, hey, you know, these expansions comes out and they make the game even better. I've played, I think, all, I think there's been three expansions for Merlin so far. And while I love all of them and what they do, each one of them has a tendency to make the game longer and longer and longer. Um, and I don't like that. And so I'm almost kind of rating this on its base box without the expansions because the game just gets too long with those expansions. So that's Merlin. Now it goes up against Orbis, which is another small, tiny little game, a tile layer that came out a few years ago. I don't think it got much attention. Trying to remember, I think it was uh, from um, Tim McPherson. Oh, I, I believe he's done a couple of things since then. But Orbis is a phenomenal, wonderful tile lane game where we are gods trying to build up our own perfect, uh, I guess they're kind of islands or countries, continents, whatever, you know, trying to build, uh, lay tiles to build up continents to, um, you know, create the perfect environment for the humans so they will worship us and give us victory. So, um, what makes the game interesting is we are, we're drafting all these tiles, grabbing them, and it's kind of like we're building a pyramid because we start out on the bottom row. Once I put two tiles next to each other, I can put another tile in between on top of them. The tiles are these little diamond shapes, and um, you know, there's all kinds of things you're trying to do: get the right tiles into the right positions, adjacent to other positions, so that you know they can trigger all kinds of you know interconnected bonuses and whatnot. And it's really, really good, tense. Fast playing, and I like it a lot. I really like it. I mean, I know, here's the thing, folks. You know, Jen and I, we've been at this for over a decade now. For the 400 games we've got in our collection, there's something like 1,500 games we've gotten rid of, some crazy big number like that, or that we played and didn't keep. And so you got to bear in mind, these games are all phenomenal. I mean, Orbis has made it through several different callings. When I moved back from Malta, to America. I had to get rid of a lot of games I really love to try and cut down on international shipping. Orbis made the cut. So as far as I'm concerned, Orbis is another one of the all-time greats. But how does it do against Merlin, one of Feld's all-time greats? Well, see, this is kind of weird. If I were judging Merlin with his expansions, I would probably take the clean elegance of Orbis. But I am going to ignore the expansions, even though I own them for Merlin and do base to base. I'm kind of breaking my rule from earlier. And I'm going to give it to Merlin, which means, once again, I push to the right. Okay. Next up. Oh. The Guild of Merchant Explorers versus Oddball Aeronauts. Oh, I'm sorry, Oddball Aeronauts. You're going to lose. Guild of Merchant Explorers, I think, was like my number two or number three best game of, was it last year or the year before? And it's so good. Such a, a phenomenal game where we are 
Uh, well, it's kind of a bingo style game because every round there's going to be a common deck of cards drawn. Tell and we draw a card, and that tells everybody what you get to do. Whether you get to explore the seas or travel through mountains or whatnot, or different ways we can explore the uh, the beautiful. Well, I think it's beautiful. It looks like kind of ancient parchment cartography maps. A lot of people think it looks like garbage because they want to see bright, you know, oversaturated, you know, beautiful cartoony land. I love the parchment look of the game. But anyway. That aside, what we're doing is the card is revealed, tells everybody what they can do right now. And we are basically going to send a couple of our, you know, usually three, if I recall correctly, of our little explorer meeples and follow whatever the card says. And we, um, you know, the thing is, the game is very sharp about this. When you play the card, you put it in a slot on the main board and everybody knows, oh, the mountain card is done. There's not going to be any more chances to explore mountains now. Oh, the big one that lets you cross oceans is done, or it hasn't come out yet. Uh, because there's not very many cards in that deck. And we're going to go, once we go through the deck, we finish an age. I think once we finish three ages, maybe four, the game is over. And, you know, there's a lot of games that really reward players for paying attention to what's still in the deck and taking risks, saying, you know what? If I could, if the, if the, if the ocean comes out before the mountain, or before the plains or whatever. And that means I could cross this and then I could get to the mountains and I'd get to that um, that mystical tower out there and that would be awesome for me. But what are the chances? See, in a lot of games, you know, a lot of deck builders and whatnot, you're just like, oh, we'll just, um, whatever comes out of the deck is what I'm going to do. I remember when this game came out, I saw some people saying, well, it's just whatever guard comes out. You just do the best you can. And like, no. You pay attention because the game go, bends over backwards to let you know, hey, these three cards haven't come out yet. Don't know the order they're going to come out in, but you can start strategizing. Well, if this one comes before that one, I should do this or that or the other. And I love it for that. And then the other thing is, there are also cards in the deck that um, when they come out, everybody gets to activate their own special, super unique, game-breaking powers they've got. And over the course of the game, we get more of these game-breaking powers. It's phenomenal. Oh, and then the other thing about it that's great, too. At the end of an age, all of our meeples that have filled up the board and explored, they all come back home unless they've been able to reach far enough to um, create outposts that they could then expand from later. So there's this expansion contraction thing that I love too. <clears throat> Sorry, I didn't have to go into that much detail. I should be a bit more snappy so we can get through more games. But again, it's fantastic, folks. Do not judge this book by its cover. A lot of people dismiss it because they think the art is not that great. Even if you're one of them, the gameplay is absolutely phenomenal. So, let's compare that to Oddball Aeronauts, one you probably haven't heard of, I'm willing to bet. Unless you're a long-time fan of the show and you remember me covering it. Here's the thing about Oddball Aeronauts that makes it special. This is a game that you can play, it's a card game you can play with one hand. Because um, you have a deck of cards that um, represents your steampunk flying through the air pirate ship and it is a dueling game where i am trying to sink your steampunk pilot uh, pirate ship you're trying to sink mine and we're doing it through almost you could call it a rock paper scissors kind of approach because cannonballs i forget the exact icons but one type of thing beats another beats another and another and the thing is i've got this deck of cards it's shuffled up i have a pretty good idea of everything that my unique crew and my unique ship is capable of but i don't know exactly what cards are coming you've got your own I can see, if I recall correctly, I can, you know, I can display it a little bit so I can see the next three cards, and I choose which card I'm going to play from those. And then that card goes to the bottom of the deck. And um, and the thing that's beautiful about this game is you can play it standing in line at the cinema um, or you know just laying on a couch. And uh, Because every turn, every, each player... It has got, you know, their cards they could pick from, you know, based on what's at the top of their deck. We simultaneously choose what we're going to pick, and then we reveal. And that's the rock, paper, scissors part. Because, um, you know, hey, as you go through your deck, I know what, you, what your deck is kind of strong for. And um, there are certain cards that incentivize you. Oh, if you've played this card, it's really good to follow it up with this type of card. So if that's the situation you're in, I know you might follow up your boarding party with a cannonball or whatever. And I know if that's what you're likely to do. If you have access to it, then maybe I should play this one because it would be 
be the perfect counter to that. And so there's all kinds of mind games that go on in this really simple, elegant, little, fast-playing system that is just so sharp. And I think the thing that Jen and I enjoy it the most is we don't have to sit and play it at the table. We can lay down on the couch together and um, just have a fun time. It is rare, folks, that I keep a game where players are directly dueling with each other. And that's what this game is. And it's fantastic. And it's a real shame it didn't catch on more. Because, I mean, again, you can check out my run-through to see why. I think, I feel like Jen might have played that with me when I did the run-through. for it. That was going to be a tough thing for me to play by myself. Regardless, though, it's really, really cool. And now that you know both these games, I must rank them. And yes, it's going to be Guild of Merchant Explorers because it is one of the um, one of the best games of the year. While Oddball Aeronauts is an oddball, unique little game. I just wanted to give it its time in the sun. Because again, it speaks volumes that a dueling game I would keep. Because we tend to play them, say, oh, we don't like this and get rid of them. This one we really enjoyed, but not as much as the Guild of Merchant Explorers. But my first left. Then we've got Golem versus Yokohama Duel. Oh, interesting. Okay. So Golem, uh, I want to say, is it from Simone Luciani? I think it's from Simone Luciani. Maybe Dan DL testing. You know, um, but regardless, whichever designer is, this is a big, heavy, complex, robust Euro where we are, it's actually uh, retelling the story of uh, you know, the, the, the Jewish parable of you know, the, uh, the Golems, the, of, of Prague and how they were originally created to save the Jewish people, but because of corruption, they ended up, you know, destroying, you know, be, becoming um, agents of destruction and all that. And um, it takes those ideas. And by the way, I should say, I was really impressed at the time. You know, if you read the rule book, they talk about how they actually worked with real tumult, um, scholars of the Talmud. Um, uh, Tumultic? Oh, I can't say the word. But anyway, um, you know, uh, Jewish scholars to make sure that they were treating the subject matter with um, deference and respect. I really appreciate they went the extra mile to do that. They didn't just say, oh, this is a cool theme. Let's just hobble it, throw it together and make a uh, an abstract euro. They really tried to do justice to the original story. And, you know, that the theme comes through because we are in this game trying to create golems who can help us out. Um, the game sidesteps what we need to the help for you know it, it doesn't go in too much into the darker aspects of the story but it's definitely there the subtext is there um so uh, you know and 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 the the cool thing is this is a worker placement game where you've got a few different types of workers normal workers but also you're drafting marbles to do worker placement stuff with this really cool marble tower that's just a lot of fun a great randomizer and the thing is as we develop our golems as they grow in strength and power, they become harder for us to control. And so we have to very delicately balance how much how much stronger we're making them so we can use them as tools and um, trying to keep control of them so they don't end up costing us points. And it's really great. I love it a lot, Jen. We were both really impressed by it. I think it was another top 10 of the year. And we talk about Yokohama Duel. This is a two-player Pretty sure, yeah, a two-player version of Yokohama, which is one of the greats. Uh, Yokohama is, well, okay, I don't, I mean, Yokohama will come up on this eventually. I'll talk about Yokohama later. Yokohama Duel keeps the theme of early industrial era Japan, you know, uh, you know, trying to switch from an agrarian society to an industrial society at the same time that foreign powers are coming to its shores and so you're trying to ally yourself with different foreign powers and all of that. Um, it is a very, very cool game that captures the theme, but really changes the gameplay. Strips out all of this really kind of unique route building stuff that the original game did, and becomes more of a card game of, you know, playing cards together and to, um, you know, to basically gather resources, get stronger and stronger and stronger at certain actions until like, okay, I have to abandon this and really focus on different things now. Um, you know, and kind of pivot. The game is one that really focuses a lot on pivoting. And I like it a lot. I really, really do. But it, you know, it is a stripped down version of one of the greats. And so I kept both of them. But I love Yokohama more than Yokohama Duel. And whereas Gollum stands alone is an absolutely fantastic game. So I'm going to go left and give it to Gollum. Okay. Binos, the deluxe edition, or the non deluxe edition, they're pretty much the same. They're, no, actually, that's not true. Not true. Come back to that in a second. Versus Cosmic Colonies. Let's talk about that one first. That's from designer Scott Alms. 
Uh, you know, most well known for the Tiny Epic series, but Scott has a lot of tricks up his sleeve. And Cosmic Colony is a fantastic game. There's two parts to it. Uh, the first part is is a card drafting game. You might think, at first glance, it looks like you know a Sushi Go type thing, or a Seven Wonders style. I got a bunch of cards. I'm going to play some. But here's the deal: in most of these kind of closed drafting games, I play a card. And then I hand all the rest to my neighbor, and then I get some more, and we keep doing that. Still the second half of the game, which is the polyomino tile lane. The tricky thing about this game is the cards I play, because, hey, that's the best one for me, those are the cards I give to my uh, neighbor. Not all the rest of them. And that, it means, you know what? The best card in my hand that I want to play for myself, if I play it, that means right afterwards, I'm giving it to you so you can play it. And maybe you're going to use that card to better effect than I will. And so maybe I should rethink it. And it's such a cool, cool twist on traditional closed drafting. I really like it a lot. Plus, the cards are multi-use. There's day and nighttime stuff. That's all really neat. Then there's the second half of the game, because all these cards are really being played to gather resources on our faraway exoplanet where we're trying to build colonies. And um, the interesting thing is... Uh, we build up the colonies by all the resources we're gathering. We convert them into polyomino Tetris tile laying things. And we're um, doing a really robust and very fun and satisfying Tetris style tile laying game as well. Trying to fit all of our different buildings to create the perfect colony, get the right things next to each other and all that. And that game is great too. Both of these games are fantastic on their own. And then combining them makes it another one of the greats. So that's Cosmic Colonies. Probably the one you may not have heard of, because it did not get anywhere near as much love as it should have. Going up against... If not designed Superstar Vita Lasarda's best game, one of his best. Vinos is a really rich, robust, incredibly complex, incredibly rules-dense game of... Did I call it Viticulture? Vinos. Of winemaking. Running multiple vineyards, crushing the grapes, aging the wine, selling it at market, entering it into contests to win, and um, managing the economy of all of that stuff. I have always been a big fan. Um, actually, CO2 was my first Vito Lasarda game we played, but C uh, Vinos is the one that really made Jen and me fall in love with them. And the thing I love about it is the action selection mechanism. You've got this 3x3 three three grid, and on your turn, you've got one little marker that represents, what am I going to do this turn? And I can move that marker to any adjacent action on the grid. I can't do the same thing twice in a row. Because I did this thing over here, now I can move to any of these spaces. Or if it's over here, I can move to any of these spaces. So the game, it's such a simple, brilliant little system, but it creates such really satisfying long-term planning. That I really love that. Even, I mean, all of Vito Lasaro's games are huge, complex, robust beasts. They always have such a simple, elegant, pure mechanism at the heart of them. And I think it's really brilliant. Now, the interesting thing is, I kind of like the original Vinos more than Vinos Deluxe. Because Vinos Deluxe changed some of the rules and made the, um, if I recall correctly, the wine competition a little bit more robust at the expense of the banking. And, the th and you know, they kind of simplified the banking system where you kind of sock away money and all of that and in a way that really kind of feels very real and natural. And they took a lot of that out. And I was, when I saw that, I was kind of disappointed. Now, it's okay. You can still play with the original Vinos rules. And honestly, I kind of prefer the original Vinos rules. And so the Deluxe Edition lets you play either way. So anyway, I'm basing this on the original Vinos rules with the Deluxe Edition's um, wonderful revamped presentation versus Cosmic Colonies. These are both fantastic games. These are both solid 8 out of 10s. I wouldn't be surprised if I were just... I mean, I'd rank them fairly close to each other. But I gotta pick one. And it's gonna be Cosmic Colonies. I love Tile Lang, and, but... That 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 kind of flipping standard close drafting on its head is so brilliant. It's got to go to Cosmic Call. Okay, then we've got oh Carcassonne the Castle versus Pathfinder Adventure Card Game Rise of the Rune Lord base set. You know what, folks? I'm looking over there. I think we've been going for just about 40 minutes. I think that's as good a place to stop as any. I'm gonna leave this as a cliffhanger for you. A wonderful, cooperative, card, um, long-term campaign deck uh, building game. 
versus uh, the Reiner Knizia version of the all-time great Carcassonne. Which is the best one? Well, you are going to have to wait until the next Rado Rankening because we're going to end it right there. I'm going to save my progress. Save. What is the date today? Today is 329. Update. And folks... Probably in a couple more weeks, we'll get back together and we will continue with the ranking. Oh, and I pushed a button and I did that. I should have known that would happen. Silly me. Uh, life on the road. Am I going to fix that? No. Um, when you watch something on my channel, folks, you get it warts and all. And uh, hopefully that's part of the charm. But anyway, hopefully you enjoyed this. Again, if you disagree with any of my calls, uh, if you're shocked by any of my calls, let me know down in the comments. And again, you hit that eye up in the top right corner of the screen, you can go check out the first five episodes of this. There was a whole bunch more of this, ranking Game X against Game Y. And I'm going to keep at it for a while, as long as you folks keep enjoying. So let me know what you think. But anyway, folks, that is it. The ranking is over. Uh, if you don't want to miss the next one, hit that right there to subscribe. And in the meantime, we got 20 seconds for you to click one of those things, including there's the rest of the ranking episodes the playlist right there we've just gotten started folks uh have you clicked a thing yet because i think we're about to end we're about to end it any second in fact i'm going to push this button right now and it's going to ending right now do it push a button push it